So we're going to go through what we use um, in our intensive grazing setup here. Um, first off, there's two different cut types of wire that you can get. There's poly braid, which is what I'm holding here, which is way better wire and way stronger. And you can't usually find this at North 40 or Western Ranch Supply. Um, we order this online. It's well worth it. It's probably 30 bucks a roll more, but it's going to last, from what I can tell, probably 10 times longer. And then there's the stuff that you would get at your regular egg retail place, which would be um, just plain old plastic poly wire. So on this poly wire, you can see the strands kind of stick up above the plastic and then it's braided with this plastic material inside. And that stuff has a tendency to crack and these wires tend to break. On this poly braid, on the other hand, it's more like a little braided rope. And can you see how these wires, they're interwoven within that, um, it's more like a rope type plasticky material instead of that cheap plastic. So first off, poly braid way better than poly wire. These are Zammer handles. These are one of the handiest things because you can either tie the wire directly onto the handle there, um, onto the metal part, and then it'll be hot if you hook it onto the wire on the fence. Or if you put it on the plastic part, you could hook this handle direct to barbed wire and it wouldn't be hot and it wouldn't ground out. So really handy little handles. These are called Zammer handles, really cheap. Um, and then the other thing is there's different kinds of spools you can get. My favorite one here is a three to one ratio. This is a Gallagher wire spool. And what three to one means is that as we're rolling this stuff up, every time we turn this handle one full crank, it's actually gonna turn this reel three times. So that's a three to one reel. This is just a one to one. So every time we turn the handle on this cheap reel, it's only gonna turn this one time. So you gotta really be cranking on this thing as you're cranking it up if you just get a cheap old one to one. So if you're gonna do a lot of moving effects, I would certainly suggest getting a three to one. This is the biggest one I think that they make. It's a little bit heavy when it gets full, but it holds a, over a quarter mile of fence if you get this bigger reel. So you can see the difference in sizes. This one would be about a quarter mile of fence, I think. This one actually, um, or I'm sorry, this one would be about an eighth mile of fence. This one's more like a quarter, and it's actually a quarter plus quite a bit if you fill it as full as we have this here. Um, the other thing is you always want to get one with this wire guide in there. That really helps it. You see how when I was screwing around here and I let it get loose, it spooled up on itself. This wire guide, for the most part, prevents that. The other thing that'll prevent that is not overfilling this reel, which I uh, have a tendency to do that because we have runs that are longer than a quarter mile that I can fit on these so we can do it all in one stretch. But when you get these over full, they can skip off the edge and then we've got to fix that problem. And it's a real pain if it really gets bad while you're rolling it out in the pasture. So. Those are the wires that we use, the different types of wire. We only use poly braid anymore. I just happen to have some of this poly wire to show you. Um, this is my favorite type of reel, a three to one reel. And then the other thing is when we get, so we'll start on one end of the fence. It's usually hot. And we'll hook this on the hot wire of our high tensile fence. We just let that hang in and we walk this out. And we'll walk this all the way to the other end until we get to the other side of the fence and just hang it on the fence here. When you hang this on this fence, um, the handle is still insulated or whatever, and so it won't be hot. If for some reason, let's say we have to start on a barbed wire fence on this end and we end up with high tensile on the other. If we're at our hot wire at the other end where we're hanging this on the fence, that's where you'd use a jumper wire. So we take a wire off the hot, the hot high tensile side of the fence and snip it, clip it onto this wire on the spool end and that'll energize our cross face for us. So on our portable water setup, what we're using on all of our intensive grazing is inch and a quarter HPE pipe, which is this black plastic, um, used a lot in the oil field type pipe, really sturdy. So you almost can't kink this stuff and you can run over it with a pickup or a tractor and it's not gonna hurt it basically. And we were laying almost all this on top of the ground. When we did that, which you'll see, I think in our later video, we had some issues when we get long runs of this, if it gets above about 75 degrees outside, that water in that portable water we're using for this with all that black plastic laying on the ground was getting up near 100 degrees. So it's getting kind of to where the cattle don't want to drink it. Um, anytime we get up above 80 degrees air temperature or so. So what we did is we buried about half of this, left half of it, half of it still above the ground so it's a little more flexible on how we move things around. And uh, we only buried it, buried it a foot deep because we're only going to use it in the summertime, but that really seemed to cut down on the heat issues. So 
we've got 500 foot spools of this. You spool that out and it's kind of a, a pain anyways when you're starting to spool this because it'll come wrapped up in a, a big round spool and it's a pretty tough pipe. What we found to be the easiest was kind of to roll it out by hand the best we could or it'll still be in a big pigtail and then pull it tight between two side by sides or a, a tractor and a pickup or something and just leave it tight. If you leave it tight there for a couple minutes and let it go then for the most part this will be laid out straight for you to use. So um, the best invention I think that they came up with for this black plastic pipe are these quick connects. And this you can find on americangrazinglands.org I think it is. So if you look up American Grazing Lands, that place sells all this cool stuff, the, the um, wire that you can spool up and these quick splices. So these are, are quick connects for this HPDE pipe. Like normally you would have to plastic weld these together when you splice this pipe. Now they've come up with these shark bite type fittings. You just push the pipe in there and then you tighten these collars around the end and you'd normally take a pipe wrench and kind of tighten this up then that's going to lock that in there and it also seals it off so it allows us to put this pipe together in multiple configurations and then when we want to go use it for something else we just pop part one of those 500 foot chunks of pipe out of here and we can drag just one chunk somewhere else there's also multiple different fittings and so you'll see this one's a straight through we can hook two pipes together this one has a t and on this t is our quick connect which you're going to see in this video um, these quick connect fittings are really cool there's just another piece that pushes in here that turns the valve on and lets water out into inch and a quarter line out to our portable water at the same time. When we pop this connection off, it disconnects, um, obviously from the line, but then it also pops this little valve shut in the inside. So there's not a quarter turn valve or anything. It just turns itself on and off. You're gonna see that um, further on in this video being used out in the field. So here's a video of our intensive grazing setup. Now this was done on our very first run of this, so some of this is a little bit crude, but you'll see we have a wire strung across for the first set. We've got portable posts spaced about every 70 feet. There's a water connector that we just talked about in this video. As you can see, you just push that connector in. It opens the valve for the water, um, and it also seals off there, and then you just pop it back out. It's gonna shut the valve off, and it's gonna disconnect the water. That obviously would be hooked to the pipe on this portable water as we go along here. So so you're seeing our portable water set up here. This is a K-line, stainless steel portable, portable water. You drag that along with the four-wheeler, super tough. Um, and then there's K-line pipe hooked to that too. And that K-line pipe's a lot more flexible than that standard HPDE pipe. So that's awesome stuff uh, as, for, as far as dragging that water along. You can see the float set up in there. And uh, that serviced about 70 head 70 pairs of cows and 40 yearlings at one time without any issues as far as them needing water. This is just rolling the fence back with that three to one wire roller, letting the cows into the next set. And then we would take that back fence down most of the time and move it forward to the next day's set. If we have trouble with them going backwards then we'd leave the back fence up and we'd have three runs of wire then laid out the back fence, the front fence, and then the next day. So you can see the cows catch on to this pretty quick. This is actually just a couple days into this intensive grazing thing a couple years ago here. So this is just showing you how the cows stay on the new grass and stay off the old. That's pulling that water with the four-wheeler. That four-wheeler will just drag that pretty simply with a chain. And then this is our three-part mineral feeder mounted on a truck tire. You just pull that along, we just put an eyelet in the front of that tire and you just pull it along with a chain too. So about a 20 minute to 30 minute project every day to move these cattle. This is them out on cover crop, um, just showing you basically cash crop grazing instead of that other stuff was perennial crop. And um, same thing, they stay bunched up really well in the new, new day's grass, and then they just move to the next set every day as we move the fence. We want to keep half and about leave half is what we're shooting for in the residue. Sometimes we do a bad job of that if we're busy with harvest or if it's really droughty and we push it. But we find on the crop ground, we can push the residue thing a little bit farther than we can on grass without affecting much because we're just gonna reseed it to a crop the next year anyways. So there's a couple ways we seed this. There's this great plains disc drill, six inch spacing thing. that's really good for grass and perennial type mixed stuff. And then the rest of it's all seeded with our Case 500 drill, which you can find in a different video, a review of that. Um, you're gonna see we're seeding into some residue here. This is winter wheat stubble, and you can see there's a very little bit of disturbance that this disc drill does as we're seeding into this stuff. So this is seed and cover crop. This was actually fall seeded. Um, 
attempt here is what we're looking at. And then you can just see the setup that we're using to seed it. Uh, Trimble auto steer hooked into a K700 and seeding about six and a half miles an hour. This is the uh, emergence of that cover crop just at the very beginning there. You can see some of the broadleaves coming up. Um, later on, we've got the turnips, radishes, and oats, and actually some mustard mixed in there, which was a bit of a mistake um, from our end as far as the cover cropping goes. And then here's just some pictures of those cows grazing on that cover on the annual crop ground, basically. You can see the portable wire fence going across there, so this was all intensive grazed. So this is taking a look at some fall seeded cover that we tried last year. We have such a short window between when the crop comes off and when it comes up that this is a harder one to pull off. But you can see a really good start to the turnips, radishes, um, some vetch in there. There wasn't a lot of top growth we got because we got snow at the end of September last year and it didn't rain on this stuff till about the second week of September to even get it out of the ground. But still really happy with the soil health benefits. So you're going to see as we dig this up, there's an amazing amount of root growth for the little bit of um, top growth that we got on this. There certainly was some grazing value left in that as well. So if you look underneath here, we're looking at a radish root right now, a turnip or a radish. I'm not really sure there. But anyways, those are really good at fracturing hard pans. This is vetch. You can see the nodulation on the vetch, and it's a really good plant for setting nitrogen and a good grazing crop. So you can see the variety of roots that we're putting in the ground all at the same time by seeding these different classes of crops. We have oats there. Those are a forage oat, which are really high mycorrhizal fungi crop. We really like those for grazing and like them for the mycorrhizal fungi portion of it. There's some vetch with the nodulation. And anytime there's uh, dirt stuck to the roots like that, you know that you're getting a lot of root, root exudates or those plants are feeding the biology in the soil. You got a lot of bacteria working. So um, there's a, probably a radish basically that's really good at fracturing the soil. You can see how deep that taproot goes and what a good job it can do at fracturing hard pans. Th this was an experiment we did where we, second year out of CRP, we went and direct seeded winter wheat into this stuff without any fertilizer and no tillage ever on this ground. So it was direct seeded directly into standing CRP. And you can look at the quality of the aggregation of the soil here is really quite amazing. So. From a soil health standpoint, some of this land being in CRP for 10 or 20 years is the best thing we could have done to this. Don't go out and break that stuff up and screw up all of that wonderful root aggregation that got built up over time by that stuff sitting without being disturbed in CRP over those years. So um, this is in the same area. This is work ground in comparison to our no-till CRP. Look at how dusty this soil is, how little moisture there is in there, and how it just falls apart. So there's no aggregation in this soil. It's been destroyed by tillage, basically. And it, really amazing. Same area, really stark contrast, right, as far as soil health. So really cool video comparing no-till to tilled.